Well, good morning, everyone. I can see a whole lot of people are starting to join us. That's fantastic. I'll just wait for a little bit longer. I do hope that you can uh, that you can hear me. And uh, looking at the people that have come in to say good morning, it's great to see so many, so many of our regular participants of our webinars joining us again today for a really important topic about older drivers. Okay, everyone, well, let's formally start our, our webinar today. For those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Joan Hughes and uh, I have a great job of being the President of Council on the Ageing New South Wales. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. It's great to have so many of you with us. And so far I'm looking down, we've got, uh, we've got 77 people who have joined us and I know there'll be a few more coming in in the next five to 10 minutes. Can I please welcome Christine from NRMA, who's going to be our speaker today and share with you some fantastic information about the main issues and concerns for older drivers. So I encourage all of you to, um, to participate and those of you who have joined um, our webinars before, it's very easy to do so. I encourage you to participate in the chat at the bottom of your screen or the Q&A function. And what Christine and I will do, um, we'll monitor those questions and we'll try and get as many of those questions answered um, by Christine, because she's the expert here today. And also you will hear from her presentation, some of those answers that you've been dying to ask, they'll be answered through her presentation, which I've just had a quick run through with her this morning and it does look terrific. So before we get started, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we are all on this morning. Where I am is in Kiama, and I acknowledge traditional custodians' connections to land, to sea and to community. And I'm here on the Wadi Wadi people of the Darawal country. I pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging and I also pay my respects to any First Nations people who are joining us for this webinar today. For those of you who don't know, now this is my advertising spiel, Council on the Ageing has been going for a long, long time and we are the peak organisation for people over 50 in New South Wales. There's one of us in every state and territory and there's COTA Australia as well. So nine COTAs across this nation trying their best to represent your needs and your interests to government, to the media, um, to policy makers, to public servants, so that your voice is not only heard, but more importantly, from my point of view, it's acted on so that we can get change for older people. Because as we all know, we're living longer and older and sometimes healthier, which is a good thing. But there are many older people who are going through difficulties and we want to represent their needs and interests as well to government and to policy makers. Um, Code of New South Wales also do a lot of different um, programs and services for older people and just a few that you might be interested in. There's one called Older Men, New Ideas, specifically targeting older men. And sadly, some stats that have just come through recently, uh, the group of people who are suiciding in our community are older men. Um, and we need to put a stop to that. So older men, new ideas where older men get together and talk about whatever they want to talk about to make themselves feel better. So that's a great service. We have a community speakers program and that's where older people like me, we, uh, we train community uh, speakers to go to communities um, to talk about any issues for older people, to help people navigate that very complex aged care system anything that older people want to know, these people are experts. So we have people talking about energy. Uh, we have now people talking about older drivers. So through Christine and NRMA, we're getting more skilled in that space as well. And we've just started a new service called Pop-Up Peer Information Hubs, where we're going to shopping centres. We've only just started this. So we've got a very small team of people, a very small team of volunteers but going to shopping centres and talking to older people about what their information and service needs might be. 
or could be and helping them find service providers that can assist um, with whatever they whatever is um, be, whatever's going to be important for them at this point in their lives. Just a little bit about Zoom housekeeping. Uh, if you haven't joined one of these before, remember this is a webinar, so um, it's not a meeting. So you guys out there in Cyberland, you're on uh, you're on mute. Um, Christine and I, of course, you can hear us. Um, when you ask your questions, you can do that, as I said, in the Q&A panel. Um, and sometimes it's a great thing where you can upvote someone else's question, which means you might be able to answer their question as well. And if you can do that with information that is correct, we would encourage you to do that. Um, during the session also, if we've got uh, resources or links that we think might be beneficial to you, We'll do that as well, as in Coda will do that. And Christine's presentation will be available to you and she'll also have some links um, to NRMA that can assist you as well. So we're here to inform, we're here to try and give you information that's going to make it easier should you want to continue driving right through to your later years. There's the chat panel, as I said, and you can make a comment during, the, during Christine's presentation and I'll be monitoring those and so will Christine. So we'll be able to then um, answer as many questions as we can. We won't probably get to all of them, but we'll give it our best. Uh, this event is being recorded and will be available shortly on Cota New South Wales YouTube channel. Can you believe that? We have a YouTube channel, very exciting, um, along with our previous webinars. So we've just done a couple recently on the Indigenous Voice to Parliament. All of our webinars go up on our YouTube channel. So um, we would always recommend people to, um, um, what's the word, to, you know, forward them on to their friends and family. Um, and so we can get this information out to as many people as we can. Well, as we all get older, of course, we experience physical, cognitive and mental changes. I don't use the word decline because it's mental changes that can impact on our ability to drive. But ageing doesn't automatically mean that you stop being an experienced or safe driver. Many people over 80 and over continue to enjoy the independence that driving offers them. For some, however, driving does become a safety risk or even an unwanted responsibility. In this webinar run by Christine, we will discuss the importance of good nutrition, adequate rest, exercise to stay strong and alert so that you can keep driving. We'll also experience and talk about the notion of what I think Christine might call, well, I call it a transition from being a driver um, to a passenger with minimal impact to your own health and well-being. And Christine has some fantastic ideas around that. So let me introduce Christine to you. Uh, Christine is the online learning and development manager in the driving training and education team for the NRMA. NRMA, as many people of you know out there, is a community organisation that exists because it has 2.7 million members. So Christine, tell us a little bit about why you got involved in this and a bit about your background before we go to your presentation. Thanks very much, Joan. Hi, everybody. Uh, I always get a little bit nervous when someone introduces me as an expert. I feel like it really raises the stakes right up there. So I certainly hope that I'm going to be able to um, meet the needs of everybody here today. And we do have quite a number of people. So before I begin, uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands from which we're holding this meeting today and want to pay my respects to the elders, past, present and emerging. A little bit about myself. I come from a background of education, from a primary school teacher. I also moved into special ed, high school teaching, consultancy for the department. Uh, and then I moved into the tertiary space with some lecturing of teaching undergrads. And then I had this wonderful opportunity at the NRMA to continue educating people and uh, built up my strengths in road safety. So my nine to five job of the day to day is to work with primary schools and high schools on our road safety education program. But I also, over the time I've been with NRMA, have supported the development of this program. And this really comes from my heart. My parents are uh, currently living an amazing life in an over 55s village. 
Uh, I said to them, I don't know how they had time to work. Every time I ring them, they're, they're never home. They're out and about, dinners, cruises, just having a, an absolute wonderful life that I'm incredibly jealous of at, at this point. And uh, I also have in-laws that are in their 80s and looking at, at what their driving futures look like. So what I might do is I might just start sharing my screen just so that you're able to see that. And what I would like to start with is I would just start like to start by saying that uh, with the NRMA, we were born to keep you moving. So that's our mantra. So in 2020, we celebrated our 100 year anniversary. And we started by advocating the needs to make roads safe for people. And that's grown over the years to help people every day with big and small problems and doing what we can to help keep them mobile and safe. And so I want to just differentiate with you because I know when I say I'm from the NRMA, a lot of people ask me questions about their insurance. That is a separate company. So when you think about where I'm coming from, you think about your roadside support, you think about the caravan parks that you may stay in, the manly fast ferries that you may catch, that's the element and the side of business I'm in and that's where our education and road safety sits as well. So for this year alone, the NRMA has rescued more than 2,000 children and more than 1,500 pets from cars. However, it's an important point to know that the majority of these cases were accidental with parents locking their keys in their car along with their children. And so that's already, when you think about we're only in April at this point in time, that's, that's a, a lot of support we've already given just in that small point alone. And last year, over 2022, we had almost 1 million member roadside callouts resolved. So it just shows, uh, you know, the important services that we that we give to our members. What I want to say at the start of this is this presentation is not designed to scare anybody uh, or into uh, perpetuating the worry that that anybody may have about driving as they get older, and both myself and, and I stand behind the NRMA when we say that we believe that drivers should continue for, to drive as long as they are safe to do so. So really, this is what all of this is about. This, the, all of the things I'm going to tell you over the course of the next hour is just about your safety. It's not about telling you what to do. It's equipping you with the information to make decisions when decisions need to be made. So the top half of the presentation is going to be a, a more of a, a refresher, I suppose, going to have, have a look at some of the, the major road rules that um, people of all stages of driving may still find confusing. I'm going to touch a little bit on pedestrian safety. And I do apologise up front, I'm going to move through that fairly quickly because I do want to get to the tail end of the presentation and this is where I want to spend the bulk of our time together and that's looking at your health and driving, looking at older driver legislation, what happens to you when you're over 75, what happens to you when you're over 85, and looking at staying mobile. And I also want to make sure that we have plenty of space at the end for Q&As. So please, if you have questions, put them in the chat, but you'll see as we go through, some of those questions may actually be answered. So if you can and you wish to hold off until the end to put those questions up, please do, because we'll, we'll have plenty of time for Joan and I to help support those answers. So what I'm going to do first is just a quick one, because this is, we find our statistics at the NRMA. This is a, a lot of issue around where crashes can occur. So we've got two different scenarios here. So when we look at merging, we have to have a look at which car has the right of way. So on the left here, you see what we call a zipper merge. That's where the dotted line in the middle disappears. Two of those uh, lanes merge into one. And then on the right-hand side there, you have traditionally where one lane continues and the left lane ends. 
So which car has the right of way? So to help us solve this problem, because you can see which car has the right of way, and I'll just quickly tell you why. It's important to ask yourself who owns the lane. So in scenario one, we can see both cars, even though they equally own that lane, the one on the left, the orange car, is in front. And if you're in front at that point, obviously you're going to make sure it's safe, but by the law, that is your lane to move into. Make sure it's safe to do so. And by law, that blue car should drop in behind you. In scenario two, even though you may feel that your nose is in front, your lane is coming to an end. The blue car actually owns that lane. What you have to do is you have to make sure that it is safe for you to move across. What would happen in this scenario? Your blinker would go on early. You would do a head check to make sure it is safe for you to move across. And in this particular scenario, you would have to slow down to make sure there was space behind that blue car for you to slot into. Even though in scenario one, you may be the orange car and you may have right of way, you still have to make that transition safely. And I think it's always a good rule of thumb as we're talking through all of these. There is no point having a crash just to make a point. I think it's always better to make sure that you're, ex you're being a low risk driver and you're making sure that you're very aware of what's going on around you so you can merge safely, whether it is a merge on the left or the merge on the right. Very quickly again, who has the right of way, car or pedestrian? A law came in not so long ago, this is for drivers, to say that you have to give way to pedestrians who are crossing the street at an intersection. So in this case, the pedestrian has right of way. When you're turning into a street, you have to make sure that it is safe. So not only are you looking for oncoming cars, but you also have to check and make sure that there are no pedestrians in that road that you are turning into. They are the more vulnerable person on the road. Therefore, they have the right of way. Again, if you want to argue about this with me within any of these points, please put a question in and we'll get to that at the end. As I said, I really want to move through, through this quickly so we can really focus on the things that I know is, that is important to you. Very, very quickly, is this legal or illegal? Of course, we know it's illegal. You cannot hold your mobile phone while you are driving. It's actually illegal for two reasons. If you look at the law really closely, it says that both hands should be on the wheel for best control of the car. So you are, by removing one hand anyway, you're not being as safe as if you have both hands on the wheel. And of course, we understand the dangers of talking on a mobile phone. It's widely publicized. And I think it's really important to mention, you are four times more likely to have a crash if you are holding a mobile phone while driving. Some people say, but it's okay, I wasn't holding it. It was just sitting in my lap and I wasn't touching it and both hands were on the wheel, so that's okay. Unfortunately, that's not okay in the eyes of the law. The law tells us that if it's on any part of our body while we are driving, then of course it is illegal. And the, the hefty thing about this is, not only is there a fine attracted to this, but it's five demerit points. And so if you are caught holding a mobile phone or having it on your person and sitting in your lap when it's double demerits, that's 10 demerit points. So that's basically your license. So it's something that they're really pushing because it is just such a dangerous thing to do. And I think you would agree with me that when you're driving around, you do see people that are talking on the phone or you may overtake someone and you're wondering why their behavior seems odd on the road. And then you say, ah, of course, because they're, they're talking on their mobile phone. So the question is, when is it legal to have your phone in the car? Always great to have it in a manufactured cradle. Make sure that you put that cradle somewhere where you can see it, because a lot of people use the map function to get around, but make sure it's not blocking your vision of the road. You don't want to create another blind spot in your car by having this somewhere unsafe. 
make sure that it is somewhere secured safely, it's sitting in the cradle. Do this before you move. So when you get in the car, set up the cradle, put the phone in, put in the GPS coordinates of where you need to go, then you can, you can start your car and move on your way. Make yourself as safe as possible, please, with the mobile phones. And as well, there are a lot of features now. If you have a newer car, you will have a button like this on your, on your steering wheel so you can use your phone um, hands-free and that it's either via Bluetooth or you may even have a voice activated. Uh, I know when I'm traveling home from work, mine's voice activated luckily. So I just ask my phone to call my mum and then I have a lovely conversation with her for, for half an hour. I've got both hands on the wheel. I'm concentrating on the road and she gets to tell me about her day. A quick one on U-turns. So if looking at these pictures, which U-turn below is legal? It's important to note whether or not the line closest to you in the middle of the road is broken or unbroken. If the line is unbroken, then you're able to U-turn. If the line is not unbroken, then no, you cannot U-turn. A lot of people will make a U-turn at a set of traffic lights. Unless there is a sign indicating that you can, you actually cannot make a U-turn at a set of lights. It's always easier to go down where you can find a street to turn right into that's a little bit quieter, safely do a U-turn and come back out onto the main street. So please, that's, that's just something to be aware of. You'll see a lot of these cropping up and that's this unbroken yellow line on the side of the road. On the left there, the unbroken one means no stopping at any time. Unless you're having some sort of emergency or you've broken down, you cannot stop there. The one on the right is a clear way. That'll come along with a sign. You'll see a sign somewhere on the side of the road that, it, that will tell you what the clear way times are, and that will indicate to you whether or not you are able to stop or not stop there in those times. Of course, if, you're, if, if it is a bus or a taxi, they are allowed to stop there to set down people and pick people up. School zones. So we have what we call what we call dragon's teeth here. So what we need to remember is this is really important. Children are incredibly unpredictable, as you know. They're easily distracted because of how young they are. They don't have the experience on the road that you and I do. And as a driver, it's our responsibility to be constantly on the lookout so we can avert any tragedy. And that's where these school zones support us. So we must obey the school zone speed limit of 40 kilometres an hour between the school zone start and end signs. In most cases, for most schools, that will run from 8 till 9.30 in the morning and from 2 till 4 in the afternoons. However, there are schools where this varies and variations you will notice will appear in red to make them really stand out to you. Any school day, any New South Wales government school day, it will be a 40 kilometre zone. Even if they are having a, a pupil free day or some other day where there's no students at the school, that zone is still in force. And that is done simply to reduce confusion in, in it in motorist mind. So we know if it's a school day, we've got to obey the, that 40 kilometer rule. Quite often it'll come with the dragon's teeth and the road sign painted. And then you will also see one of these signs. And in most cases now, they will be ones that are lit up now to let us know, really alert us that it is time to slow down during that eight to 9.30 and 2.30 to 4 p.m. <clears throat> everyone's favourite point of discussion, the roundabout. I think the, the easiest thing to remember in a roundabout is remember what the intersection may have been like before the roundabout was there. If you are coming into a, into a T intersection like this, 
you would never just sail on through without looking at where the traffic is coming from. If there was traffic already in that intersection, of course you are going to slow down and you are going to safely move through there. And I think that is a good rule of thumb. The good rule of thumb is, as you slow down to have a look, if there are other cars in the roundabout, give way to them. And you make sure that you can move into that roundabout when it is safe to do so. When you have a one lane roundabout, it is a little bit easier to navigate. When you have a two lane roundabout, of course, as you know, the left lane is generally a turn left or go straight ahead. And the right lane is a go straight ahead or turn right. It's always a good idea if you're going straight ahead in a, in a, a roundabout such as this one you see here, when you're getting close to the exit as you're going straight ahead, you need to just put your indicator on to let motorists know that you're leaving and you're not continuing around that roundabout. Uh, I did have a video I was going to show you, but I'm going to go past that because I'm sure you're all very well versed on roundabouts. And if not, we can discuss that further at the end. I would love to discuss that with you. Now, Again, as I said, we're talking about giving way to more vulnerable people on the road. So we've talked about pedestrians, we've talked about young children near schools, and now we're going to talk about bicycle riders. When you are coming up to a rider who is riding on the side of the road, you have to give them one metre of space if you're doing 60 kilometres or less. If you are doing more than 60 kilometres, then you have to give them 1.5 metres of room. Now, some people say to me, but Christine, if I'm on a road with a single lane and I've got an unbroken line and I've got a bicycle rider, does that mean I have to break the law? No, you don't have to break the law. What that means is you are exempt from that time. You are allowed to cross an unbroken line when it's safe to do so to move that one metre space so you can safely get around that cyclist. If there are cars coming the other way and it is not safe to do so, then you should slow down until it is safe and you are able to pass that cyclist with that one metre or 1.5 metre gap, depending on what the speed sign is in that area. Again, it's just about keeping those on the road that are more vulnerable than you are in the car safe. Safe driving tips. I just wanted to quickly show you there are five most common crash types and here they are here. And it's dependent upon whether you live in a built up area or a suburban area as to whether you live in a more rural and remote location. If we have a look at the crash types four and five there, they are generally caused by speed, fatigue and driver distraction. So when you have a look at crash three, that's generally by poor gap selection. So not judging how fast or how close that car is coming towards you. Lack of patience, or just not seeing that the road was clear before turning. And in crash two, this occurs because people don't adhere to stop or give way signs. And of course, crash number one, that's where someone may be following too close behind and there may be some speeding and distraction involved in that. Number one, you lovingly know is the rear ender. So in city locations, the most common crash is number one, is the rear ender. In regional areas, crash four and five are the most common because it's generally caused, as I said previously, by speed, fatigue, distractions. And in a lot of cases, not adhering to the speed advisory signs just before corners. So to avoid a rear ender, we have that uh, crash avoidance space. So that old three second gap, as you know, pick a landmark, when the car in front goes, count to three, hopefully then you're getting to that landmark. If you get there before you get to three, then you are just too close. Um, you'll see now on some of the major motorways, they have the chevrons and they ask you to keep the, the three marked chevrons on the road between you and the car in front of you. 
When you're at stoplights, a lot of the time crashes are caused by somebody who rear ends you. And then because you have stopped too close to the car in front, then of course you move, the momentum carries you into the car in front. Good rule of thumb to try and stop this from happening is as you pull up at the set of lights, can you see the car tires on the road, their back tires in front of you? If you can, then you've allowed a decent gap. That's the, the perfect amount of gap to have. If you pull up behind them and you can't see their, their back tires meeting the road, then you've pulled up too close and you are at risk if someone hits you from behind to push you into that person. This is really about reducing stress when you drive. And I think this is, this is great advice. I do this myself. I live in quite a residential area and I have two ways that I can go to my shops. One is a more direct way. However, I find it is quite stressful for me to turn right into the shopping centre because there, there is a great deal of traffic around. So you can see here, if, if you're the car waiting at the lights, you can follow the red path where you then have to negotiate what is that bike rider doing? What is that pedestrian doing? Is a car going to come up behind me? Because not only am I turning right, but then I'm very quickly putting on my left indicator to turn into the shopping centre. Whereas if I just took that extra 30 to 60 seconds of time, I could follow that green path, come around into the shopping centre. I could give more notices on turning into the shopping centre it's less stressful and it actually reduces your risk of crashing or somebody rear-ending you. Blind spots. We know that it is absolutely not possible to design a car without creating blind spots and we can't set up our mirrors completely to stop uh, those blind spots. So this is where our mandatory head checks come in. And this is a, a very important skill because a bit later I'm going to talk to you about uh, the items in the uh, driving assessment. And part of this is head checking. And when do you need to do this? It's really important if you're deviating from your path, that's when you need to use a head check. So if I'm changing lanes, I can see that there is nothing around me. I've looked in my side mirrors. I've looked in my revision mirrors. I still need to do a head check just to ensure that there's nothing that's creeped into my blind spot. And certainly people on bikes tend to, to move that little bit quicker into your blind spot. Uh, when you're doing a U-turn, there is a, a number of factors that you have to consider about traffic coming from either side to side or back the other way as you're doing a U-turn. So it's important that you do do a head check to make sure you're safe to get around, obviously merging, and when you're getting out of the car, if you're parking on the side of the road and you're getting out, we say to kids, we call this side of the road the danger side because you're getting out at the, at the business end. You've got cars going past you. You might have people cycling past you. It's really important to check and see that there's nothing coming before you open your door um, into, into that traffic to get out of the car. Um, it's very easy if you've got somebody that can help you um, sit in your car when it's parked, adjust all your mirrors, and then get a friend to walk from behind your car to the point where you can see them in your side mirrors, and then have them keep walking to the point where you can't see them. If you put down a marker there and you get out and have a look, that section in the blue, that's your blind spot. So that's the danger area. And this is why we need to do a head check to minimise that danger. Reversing, so this is what we can see when we look through our rear vision mirror. If we turn around out the back and have a look, that's what we can see out the back. Uh, I go and get in my car, I get in, I make sure that my maps are set before I even start the car. I make sure I've got the music on that I wish to listen to depending on my mood and whether I feel like something a little bit upbeat or a little bit more calming depending on where I have to drive to, and then I'm ready to reverse back. Now, unfortunately, in that time, things can change. You've had a look in, in your revision mirror, you've had a look out the back, you looked around as you got in your car, there was nothing there. 
in the time that you have put your belt on, put your bag down, put something else on the seat, what you find, oh, sorry, is this may have happened. You've got someone walking behind your car and bending over. You can't see that out the back. So what we can do to mitigate this is we need to make sure that when you're reversing out and you've done all of your checks, you move very slowly. I'm talking walking pace as you reverse back. It allows then for anybody to be alerted to you moving and hopefully be able to move out of your way as well. If you have somebody in the car with you, perhaps they might have been able to spot a hazard for you and they can let you know. And the great thing, which is what I do here at my own house most of the time, I reverse into my driveway. So I'm actually driving out because we have a lot of people in our street that, that are, are walking all hours of the day at night. Uh, I'm near a school, so there's kids walking home to and from school. So I find it's it's less stressful for me if I reverse into my spot at home and then I'm going to drive out and, and, and have a really clear view of what is happening for me to get out onto the road safely. Uh, Joan and I were talking about this just earlier. We were talking that, you know, for, for a long time, we, we talked about defensive driving and being good defensive drivers. Uh, that's gone through a rebrand over the years and we don't call it that anymore. Now we call it low risk driving. So this is uh, some, some new terminology or this may be something that you've heard of before. I know I didn't until I started working for the NRMA and, and doing a lot of work in this space, but low risk driving is what we want. And low risk driving is really about being present when you're driving and really monitoring not just what's directly in front of you, but what's around you as well. So when you have a look at this picture here, you may already have spotted by looking at it some things that you need to be aware of when you are moving down this street. And here are some things here. You can see this car on the left, their wheels are turned, they're ready to come out. We have to make sure we've got our brake covered. Are we sure that they're not going to pull out in front of us or onto us? Have they seen us? We've seen them, so we can be a little bit more cautious. That lady there who's choosing not to walk on the footpath, that, that's quite a dangerous spot for her to be walking in. That's something where you may need to really slow down and let her move off that part of the road before you can safely navigate that bit of a chicane there. You can see that there is a, a car that's oncoming there. We can't quite see properly because of the pole, but they might have a blinker on. They may be wanting to turn. They may be going straight ahead. Are we sure about what their intentions are? And then a good indicator in the background there, we can see a crane. We know we're heading towards building works. That means we have to be prepared that probably road conditions are going to be a little bit different. And then again, even as we move 100 metres up the road, same road, but we can see now conditions are starting to change again. So we're in a school zone now, so that's one thing we need to be aware of. We've got someone who is turning here. We need to monitor to make sure they actually get around that corner. Sometimes people may change their mind, and if they suddenly change their mind and not turn and they wish to go straight ahead, you can see what's going on in front there. The lane has been closed off and they go down to one lane. So if you're approaching really quickly to that person and they decide they're going to move in because the, they can see that that lane has closed down, again, low risk driving is not only driving for yourself, but they will say to drive for everybody else around you to keep you safe. And you also see there, which is quite difficult to see, but just hidden by this car, there's a car that's waiting there. We're not sure whether they're going to turn right. We're not sure if they've just slowed down to come through the intersection. So you have to be prepared that that person may try and select that gap between you and the car in front to turn into that street. And hopefully that's enough time for them, but you have to have your, your foot over the brake and covered ready should that person turn in front of you so you're not going to hit them.
And that's what I've just said. Very quickly on pedestrian safety. I'm not going to go through all of these points, but I think it's really, really important. And I, as I said, there's a lot of people that walk around my area and they do so at dusk, especially in the summertime when it's a little bit cooler. If you're going to go for your morning walk or afternoon walk or your jog, wear bright clothes. Please don't wear dark clothes and walk on the road. Where you can walk on the footpath. If you have to walk on the road, walk against the traffic so you can see what's coming and please be seen, wear bright clothes. Crossing at a roundabout. Crossing at a roundabout is always has a huge danger here. So there's three ways you can cross at a roundabout. You can cross at point A, point B, or point C. I think it's very, very easy for you all to see which one is the safest. Of course, that would be crossing at point A. Any time you can get away from the business end of a roundabout and walk further down to cross, please always take that option. Trying to navigate a crossing of a roundabout at part B is incredibly dangerous. You have cars that are moving at speeds that are a lot quicker, especially if it's multi-lane, you're monitoring so much movement of, of those cars around you. It's very, very dangerous. And the recommendation is at no stage, cross a roundabout like you see in, in section B here. Section C isn't the safest. However, sometimes if you have a shopping trolley or you're on a motorized scooter, the dip in the road may be a point C. It may be the safest place for you to get your shopping trolley off and across over to the other side. If you do have to cross at point C, please take as best care as you can. If you, but point A is always the safest place. Now we're going to get to something that I think is really incredibly important. And I just want to start this by saying, I'm not a medical professional. I told you my background's in education. I am certainly not a medical professional. I cannot tell you from your, each of your individual circumstances what the right thing is for you to do. I can give you some general information but please, if anything we talk about today, if you have questions about your own health or the health of a loved one or a friend, please go and speak to, to a doctor about it so you can get some further information. So everyone's health changes over time. And if you notice your health changing, then you need to go and talk to your doctor and have a discussion with them if you believe that a health condition may affect your driving. So some of the things you need to consider, so you can assess this yourself. So what do we know that we need to be a, a safe driver? We know that generally we need good hearing and vision, especially vision. We say we need good hearing, that keeps us safe as if we're listening out for sirens, cars, bike bells, but vision especially. And especially when you're driving in that awful strong afternoon sun, which is difficult for everybody, when you're driving at night or in low light conditions. If you can drive through these conditions and you feel safe doing so, then that's a good indication that you're, you're still on, the, on a, a good path. However, if you start getting concerned about these elements of driving, then perhaps a conversation with your doctor might be a great idea. So I'm thinking about eye conditions, particularly such as cataracts, glaucoma, macular degeneration. All of this can make it hard to see cars, see people and see hazards. We need a level of strength and flexibility. So we're talking about turning the steering wheel. And once again, with those head checks of, of looking around us and behind us, we do need to move our bodies our necks and our heads to see things in our blind spot. 
even our problem solving skills. So when we're talking about problem solving, we're talking about memory and decision making as well, because I think you would agree with me, driving is a complex skill. There's a lot of things we all we take in when we're driving and we put all of that together to make sure that we are that we remain safe. And we need to process and we need to store information and then we need to make decisions in response to constantly changing situations. So if you believe that that is a problem for you, then a conversation with your doctor would be a really great idea. Medications is another thing to be very aware of. Of course, medications are super important for many people to maintain good health and quality of life. And it's important to know how those medications will react with driving so you can take precautions. So I'm talking about medications, not just prescription medications, but some over-the-counter medications as well can affect, affect our perception of hazards, reduce our reaction times and impair our decision making. And of course, as we all well know, mixing medications with alcohol can significantly affect driving abilities and that should be avoided. So please read the labels of the medication you're taking uh, before you're driving. If you've been prescribed new medication, just have a brief discussion with your doctor about whether or not this will impact your ability to be safe behind the wheel. Another emerging health condition that we've discovered is sleep apnea. It's a serious medical condition. And the byproduct of that is it's likely to make you very tired during the day. So if you're waiting for treatment, if you've been diagnosed and you're waiting for treatment, try and limit your driving until your condition is under control because we know that fatigue is a big contributor to crashes also. I want to touch on driving and dementia. Although dementia can affect anyone, it is more common in people over 65. And driving, as we've just mentioned, is a complex task. And as dementia progresses, the skills needed to drive can decline to a point where drivers are no longer safe. Often the person is not aware of these changes. And as a loved one or a friend, you may need to step in and help. Conversations with loved ones can be difficult, but they are essential. And then as is a plan to get together, should they need to retire from driving? So what happens after a diagnosis of dementia? That doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to be able to drive because you have this diagnosis. It means that you now have the responsibility to do a few things. You must report it to Services New South Wales and your doctor can help you do this. There's a form that can be completed and your doctor can support you. You undergo an assessment with an occupational therapist. And this is just so they are monitoring your skills and the skills required for driving. If the occupational therapist and your doctor clears you, you may still be allowed to drive. And this will be reviewed annually. It's reviewed annually because it's going to be a, a degenerative process. Now, some people say, oh, well, you know, I, I just won't report it. You know, I just won't say anything. Unfortunately, if you've received a diagnosis from your doctor and you choose not to report it, it is against the law. You do risk prosecution. But I think even if you put that aside, Another thing is your insurance becomes invalid at that point. So you're paying a lot of money for comprehensive insurance for then a claim to be denied. Even if you look at the law side of things as well as the financial side of things, I think really the driving force here is safety. It's your safety. Your safety is more important than insurance, than anything else, it's your safety that is of most concern. Sometimes people are driving, but they, they haven't received a diagnosis, but we can see that they may be displaying unsafe driving behaviours. This may be time to commence the, the difficult but important discussions about driving. Uh, it's a hard thing to do, 
but it's better coming from a friend and a loved one rather than it being enforced on someone by a, a law or services New South Wales. So this is just a list of things to look out for. I think the major thing on there is that bottom one. If you, if you see that your loved one has increased dents and scratches in the car, that may be an indication that their driving may be impaired and it, it may be time to uh, certainly have that discussion with them. Uh, obviously, misjudging speeds, misjudging distances, misjudging turns, forgetting how to get to familiar places are all signs for you to, to start those conversations with uh, someone you love and care about. So now I want to look at what is the licensing legislation. Before I start this, I'm an NRMA expert. Yes. Am I a road safety expert? Yes. Do I work for the New South Wales government? No, I do not. So I can't tell you why things, I can tell you why. I can't tell you should legislation change, shouldn't it change? I, I can't really debate that with you. I can as a human being to human being, but what I'm here to tell you is what the legislation is now, why it is in place and what you can do. Be on the lookout for this book. When you turn 75, you'll receive a copy of this booklet. You don't have to wait until you're 75 to look at this booklet. If you go onto Google and type in a guide to old, older driver licensing, it will come up and you can read through it. It's actually a really good book. It lays things out by Transport for New South Wales and it lays everything out, I think, really quite clearly. So a lot of information that, that I'm putting in here and talking to you about comes from this document. So you will receive this generally about eight weeks out from your 75th birthday. And what it will do, it will tell you and give you instructions that you need to go and see a doctor because you now need annual medical examinations. There is a letter that is attached to this booklet that you will be sent. And when you go and visit your doctor, you, you and your doctor will have a discussion. He, will, he or she will consider if you're medically fit to continue to drive. The doctor will complete that form and that form is returned to Services New South Wales. That can be done in one of two ways. Most doctors now are on the portal with Services New South Wales, and they simply can complete that online and submit on your behalf. There may be some doctors that don't have that capability at this point, and they may fill in a paper copy of the form, return it to you, and then it's your responsibility to get that to your nearest Services New South Wales. If you have a discussion with your doctor, from the initial assessment and there is elements a doctor is concerned about, they will retain that letter. They'll refer you on for further medical investigations, which will come back to that doctor again, and then there can be a discussion. But remember, the choice is always yours. You may reach 75 years of age and you may wish to restrict your own driving. You may wish that at this time, you're going to take that pressure off yourself. And there are certain locations you need to get to, but outside of that, you don't, you don't want to drive any further. You can discuss that with your doctor and you can go on to a restricted license if you wish. If you wish to maintain your unrestricted license, then again, it's, a, it's an ongoing, each year medical examination. And that is until you reach 85. At 85, there is a little bit of a change to this. You still require a yearly annual medical. And then you again have two options. Option one is you can just accept that you're going to have a modified license. So you don't have to do any further assessment uh, and, and just have some restrictions placed on you. And that's something that you negotiate with Services New South Wales. So you sit down with them, you may say, my, my Woolworths is five kilometres away, my, the doctors and specialists are, are 10 kilometres away, 
and there may be a radius placed on you. That may be your restriction. There may be a 15 kilometre radius or as per negotiated by that services New South Wales. If you're somebody who lives in a rural or remote area, that trip to, uh, to get groceries or daily supplies, as well as your doctors, that may be a, a much larger area and the distance you may need to travel is much larger. So your radius may be a lot larger than that. That's something that I can't tell you from person to person. That is actually an individualised plan that you come up with by working with them at Services New South Wales. If you think that you would like to continue to have an unrestricted licence, then you have to complete a driving test at Services New South Wales or a driving assessment with the driving school. Now, please, I'm going to explain this to you in the next slide, but I just wanna let you know this assessment happens every two years. I think the word test there is, is a little bit harsh. It's not like when you were going for your L's you know, when, when we first got our licenses. It's an older driver's test and there's one of two ways you can do it. Let me first speak to you about there is a free way to do it. So you can go free of charge to Services New South Wales and you can book in for an attempt. Remember, if you go through Services New South Wales, while it is free, you only get three attempts. If you fail three attempts, you are automatically given a modified license. At any stage after that, you can upgrade from a modified license to an unrestricted one by passing this senior driving assessment later on down the track. The following year, you could attempt that. It is free, but there are three attempts only. It will be at your nearest Services New South Wales outlet, and that may be located somewhere where roads may not be as familiar to you. And of course, you just get the driving assessor that is assigned to you for that day. For some people, and I, and I know probably for me, that would be a little bit overwhelming. So there is another option. You can have an assessment with an accredited instructor. So if you type in senior driver assessment instructors into Google, Services New South Wales has a list of every one of them who is qualified to support senior driver assessments in New South Wales. You can simply search by area and pick one that is close to you. Alternatively, you can go to mynrma.com.au. We have a whole lot of senior driver assessors. You can ring us, tell us that is what you need and we can book you in. The good thing about this is, is the assessor comes to you. So it's in the streets that you know, it's your surrounding streets. There is a fee. So this is something that you will pay for. The good news about this is, is it's unlimited attempts. So you can be with that driving assessor, senior driving assessor, and you can go for sessions week after week after week. A lot of our NRMA members tend to book a refresher lesson to start with, combined with an, a driving ass assessment. Many people don't even know they're being assessed and think they're just having a refresher session and surprised when they get the good news at the end that, oh, you've actually passed your assessment. So what I'm going to do is quickly tell you what the fail items are. Now that booklet I showed you earlier, it's all outlined in there. So there's, there's no tricks there. You will fail if you disobey a traffic signal, traffic sign or road markings. You will fail if you don't give way when necessary. You will fail if you collide with a vehicle, pedestrian or object. You'll fail if you perform an illegal act or manoeuvre on the road. If you exceed the speed limit. If you do anything where action and intervention is required by the testing officer. If you cause a dangerous situation or if you fail to maintain proper control of the vehicle. 
So hopefully you can see by those fail attempts, it's not like when we first got our license. You don't have to prove that you can reverse park or pull up on the side of the road. It's about your safety. Can you still do all of those things? Can you get from point A to point B safely, making sure you're adhering to the road rules and the signs? So I'm really hoping that that puts your mind at ease a little bit. It's actually not as, as stressful as uh, it first appears on the outset. And just a, a word there, not all areas have accredited older driver assessors available. So that's why I'm saying maybe look at not only my NRMA, but also look at that Services New South Wales list to try and find someone that's, find the person that's going to be closest to you. The NRMA helps you maintain your independence. So maintaining your independence is important. And the NRMA recommend a refresher lesson before you go with either option, whether you're going to go to Services New South Wales and have your assessment, or whether you're going to have that assessment um, through a, a paid assessor. Uh, this will help increase your confidence, polish up, to ensure you maintain your mobility and your independence. Uh, even if you don't have an older driver assessor in your area, you can still access a driving instructor for a refresher before the big day if you're going to go through services in New South Wales. If you go onto the NRMA website, there is this booklet as well, which is very similar to the booklet I showed you earlier. So if you put in maintaining your driving independence and RMA, you're going to get a copy of this booklet that comes up for you as well. Good thing is these driving assessments, if you go with a private assessor, it starts from your home. So your comfort, your comfort level already is at an all time high. Now I want to just quickly talk about staying mobile when not driving. Should you make the decision to retire from driving, that doesn't mean that you lose your mobility and your independence. So there are a variety of things. Obviously, this is going to be different from area to area. But some of the things you should look for is if you're somewhere who, uh, if you're someone who is in a really built up area and you have things that are close by, uh, you know, perhaps you can, you can walk to your local shops or uh, have a, a trolley to bring the shopping back in um, with wheels or even a mobility scooter that, that you can use. I know when I'm mentioning taxis here, I know you. The, the first thing you think is, oh, how could I catch taxis everywhere I needed to go? That would cost me an absolute fortune. We say something to the kids here where we talk about um, transport and cars being a lazy asset. And it is a lazy asset because think about where your car sits most days. Usually it sits in your garage or out the front of your house or even when you take it somewhere it's sitting in a car park which you're no doubt paying for and you're making sure you're not there two hours longer than you need to be so you're not paying for parking uh, but the statistic at the moment with the cost of living the way it is the cost of car ownership is approximately three hundred dollars a week so if you retired from driving and you no longer had a car three hundred dollars a week is going to get you a lot of taxis if you have taxis nearby. It's going to get you a lot of public transport if you are able to move about on public transport, buses, trains, etc. I understand that in some areas, the public transport is not great. Maybe you're in areas that are, that are more rural and taxis are not easy to come by please go and talk to your local council. There are a lot of community and health related transport options that are through each local council. And I'm sorry, I can't tell you what each of those is because it will vary from council to council. Don't forget as well, you've got the option of a seniors Opal card, which means that 
um, public transport for you using that Opal card is much cheaper also. And that's the end of the presentation. So now I'm going to, to uh, stop sharing my screen and hopefully there are a lot of questions, Joan, that I can answer. Oh my goodness. I'm sitting here thinking, Christine, it was just fantastic. Thank you so much. And uh, there have been comments coming through. Um, the consistent theme is, Christine is such a great communicator. Christine is, you know, so I think um, with something that is so technical and very important to people, you have a very good way of communicating the important information. So, yes, thank you so much for that. I was writing down a whole range of things and then I think, oh dear, you know, I am, I do, I do think it's important to drive, but I've always been a person who's been what I call a functional driver, as in I use it because it you know, allows me to get to work or it allows me to do shopping, all of those sort of functions of life. But I have to say just recently, since I've um, gone into the new chapter of my life and not in paid work, I am enjoying driving around country areas. So for the first time for ages, it's just been terrific to um, experience, you know, country New South Wales or country Victoria, and I've enjoyed um, that driving. But some of those things that you shared with us, I'll definitely put into action because as I get older, I think that whole thing of changing lanes, I thought that slide that you shared with us was, was so important, but being able to look to make sure you do that, not just use your mirror to do that is really, really important. So let's go to some of the questions now. Christine, can you see them as well? Yes, I'm just, I'm, I'm listening to you with one ear and I'm oh, trying okay. to, to <laughs> read enough. with one eye. So, you know, thank you. Thank you, everybody that, that uh, who said the presentation was great. And I really do appreciate and take on board any feedback because I, I am delivering this presentation again next month and, and fairly regularly. Um, into the future. So it's it's really great to hear back where I've hit the mark and where maybe I've missed the mark and, and you can help me improve this. So, uh, so let's go, Christine. Anne, Anne has um, asked a few questions, but I think it's, it's that whole complexity or understanding of the rules of roundabouts. And she says here, the first question is, uh, the round of that a person on the right has the right right of way, but I think the first car at the roundabout has the right of way. Which person has the right of way? That's the question. Yes. And really, I think you you have to look at it as in the same way as you look at a T intersection. It's really a case of yes, you you generally you would give way to traffic on your right. So you would have to monitor that that traffic that's coming into the roundabout. So if you have quite a large roundabout. Um, and for, for those of you who may live in, in Sydney, if any of you do, and um, have been at that um, dreaded roundabout at Polding Street in, in Fairfield, it, um, you, know, you, you really enter that with a bit of a wing and a prayer. And you really do need to monitor what is happening on your right. Uh, and you can't always trust a blinker either. That's, that's something that we need to be aware of. You really need to see clearly the person's intentions that they are moving, they are turning left into, into that road before you can safely get out. I think it's, it's always better to hesitate and be a little bit more careful than it is to dive in and then have someone swinging around that roundabout. So generally, if we think about that very old rule, which is, is still relevant of giving way to our right when we enter the roundabout, then again, that marries with that rule of what we were talking about of giving away, giving way to traffic that already is in that roundabout, if that makes sense. And the idea is utilising the blinker. Just think about when you want to know when people are exiting. So if you've got somebody coming around the roundabout towards you and they're not indicating but then suddenly they, they shoot off, you, what's the first thing you say in your head? Oh, they could have used a blinker. You know, it would have been nice to know. I, I might have been able to go there. So I think it's really important that as you get close to your exit, you put your left-hand blinker on to indicate that you're 
that you're turning off that roundabout bend. So it just gives people around you that understanding of, of um, where you go. Okay, Christine, there's um, another question which we didn't really get into, I suppose, this whole new world of electric cars. And I think this question is really important. Um, this person says, finding electric cars and bicycles far too quiet to alert me to the, to the approach from behind me. So apart from, this person says, apart from looking continually around me, what else can I do both as a driver and a pedestrian to be a bit more alert? Good question. I think I think the the wonderful thing is is thank you for mentioning that. I did actually toy with whether or not to to address electric vehicles in this presentation because yes, they are silent. Um, uh, at the NRMA here, if if you monitor what we do in open road and and you look at our website, we're big supporters of electric vehicles and and supporting the environment moving forward and. That is one of the big dangers that uh, I do talk about quite regularly is the fact that they are silent. They, they make zero sound. So I think not only is it a danger when you're driving, I think the greatest danger is when you're, when you're a pedestrian. When you're crossing the road, you, you need to ensure that all of the other skills you have you really make sure that you're looking carefully and watching carefully for cars because you can't hear them. Um, it is mandated in Europe. There is a switch on the car that you can turn on and it makes sort of a, a, a buzzing noise. And that's actually in Europe, they actually make that standard that you have to have that on. So the car is actually making noise so mm -hmm. you, can, you can hear it coming. However, we don't hear, and most people keep it keep it turned off, so it is silent. I would say, in terms of what can what can we do when you're travelling in a straight line, when when just just your general day to day driving or getting from point A to point B, you're monitoring your revision and side mirrors anyway. That's where it makes that head check important because while you're maintaining your lane, then that's okay if someone's coming up past you and you may not necessarily see them. Where it becomes a danger is if you want to change lanes. So what you really need to do is just watch and monitor and do that head check before you move over into the next lane. Great. Now, this one is about new cars and no spare tyres. Um, and this is, again, from Anne because she's been on a country road just recently. And she's obviously got a new car and it's happened to her three times. They don't have a spare tyre. Got any ideas? Hopefully you've got NRMA roadside membership. <laughs> As a bit of a plug. <laughs> that, well, would, that would be my, my main point. And look, I'm I'm sorry, I can't, you know, I'm not I'm not a dealer manufacturer, so I, I can't. I would say to you, um, obviously, and, and I think. I think um, it may have been Anne that alluded to this. If you need to pull over because you, your tyre has gone flat, you really just need to make sure that you limp along till you get to somewhere that is safe. Reduce your speed right down. The, the tendency is to go with the urgency of the situation and want to pull right over. But if you are on some of those country roads, it, may, it just may not be safe at 110 to stop uh, where that, that flats occurred. So you may just need to put your hazards on, limp slowly to where you there is a bit more of a shoulder that you can get off. And just it's about keeping yourself safe, really. Um, can I also just jump in here and say, I, I noticed another one as I was flicking through, just to go back to the assessments. Um, Shirley, you're right. A doctor cannot cancel your driver's license. That's not the doctor's role. The doctor is making a recommendation and it is Services New South Wales that, that will take that on board. Uh, however, it's obviously way better from your doctor to get that, um, that clean tick that goes to Services New South Wales that makes the recommendation that you retain your, your licence for that point. Um, stay on the theme of assessments, Christine, because the, a question has come through with the senior driver assessment, is there any theory? Apart from the practical, are there any questions that you have to answer? No. Nope. 
Okay. No, it's just, and again, it's, and that's where I think the difference is, you know, I, I remember you, you go back to the day we all remember when we initially got our license and, you know, I, I think I was incredibly stressed at that time. You know, you have to, to do your pen and paper test and, and then you get um, some very cranky looking driving assessor that, you know, barks orders at you and, and tells you when to reverse park. It's really not like that at all. It's really just to make sure that you are still able to do your head checks, to follow the signs, to be safe on the road for yourself and obviously all of the other road users as well. Okay. Well, there are a few more questions, but I think we're getting towards the end of our time. And, and as always, Christine, with our webinars, we could go on for a lot longer, but uh, we've decided that uh, people concentrating and listening uh, actively for this period of time is probably enough. But the good thing is, um, I think this has been such a popular topic, Christine, if you're willing to come back and, and do another one with us, we would very much appreciate that. And there's probably a couple of things that, uh, like the, uh, the new world of electric cars, that, that would, might be of interest to people as well. But the most important message that you have shared with us is about safety, and you've given us so many fantastic safety tips. Plus, um, those two booklets, I would encourage people to... Um, to make sure they download them. Um, the important thing is, folks, is that um, what Christina shared with us today, as I said, this has been recorded, so it will be available in the next couple of days that you can have a look at it again. I think having another look and a listen would be a good thing because there's so many aspects um, and rules that Christine shared with us that you sort of remember now, but you may not tomorrow. So having a bit of a refresher webinar would be a useful thing. And as I said, please uh, share it with your friends and family because the messages about safety and older people are absolutely essential so that we can have a quality of life. Um, as I mentioned to all of you out there that uh, we have regular uh, webinars and the last two that we did were about the um, the Indigenous voice to Parliament, the sort of yes campaign and the no campaign. The reason to do that, as all of you know out there that know anything about Code of New South Wales, is that we're apolitical. So when we get into those areas of policy development, we have to make sure that we're giving you enough information so that in this particular case, you can make an informed um, you can make an informed vote when the referendum comes around later in the year around the voice. So we're still only, uh, what month are we in? Oh, we've still got plenty of webinars to go until the, <laughs> until the end of the year. So uh, the topics coming up, folks, we'll be doing one around loneliness. Uh, we always say that's probably one of the hardest things for older people when things change in their life, give up work, you have to give up driving, um, you lose your partner or you lose your good friends and loneliness becomes one of those really, really difficult things that uh, we all have to manage and do something about in our lives. So we'll be having a webinar about loneliness. We'll also be having one around employment, uh, ongoing issue for all of us uh, as we leave or try and re-enter the workforce. There's so much ageism out there uh, regarding older workers. And we know that we can it still contribute if our minds and and our bodies are still going strong and we still want to stay in the paid workforce, then we are a resource that communities and governments need. So just, uh, just on closing, can I again thank Christine very, very much. Uh, you've been an excellent presenter. We'll thank have you, you back. Um, oh, I'm happy to come back whenever you need me. And I hope... <laughs> Oh, good. And I hope you can share this with your mother. She'll be pleased to see her daughter on the screen spreading, spreading yeah. the, the good news about uh, issues for, for older drivers. So thank you again. Um, folks out there, please take care. As you know, we're entering uh, the cooler months and winter is going to be upon us before we know it. So make sure you get your vaccinations up to date. Very important to stay healthy uh, during this time. And we know that COVID has not gone away. And uh, we want people to make sure that they have vaccinations and keep that up to date, as well as your flu vaccination. So until I see you next time, stay healthy, stay calm, stay connected, and I'll see you soon. Bye, Christine. Thanks, everyone. Bye.